The term, You Cannot Go Home Again, is actually a title of a novel by Thomas Wolfe. Has anyone ever read the book? I have not. I just knew the term, so I actually looked it up. And it's about a fictional character named George Webb, who wrote a novel about his hometown, his family, and his friends. It became a bestseller. He became filthy rich. So he went home, and to his dismay and shock, everyone shunned him. Because, see, he fictionalized his family members and friends, but they they were highly offended by their portrayal of the book. He was so met with hostility that he finally packed his bags and went away, traveled the world, and he never made it back home again. So that's how we came up with the term, you cannot go home again. Some of you in here, or you may know people that have that feeling that they cannot go home again. They have left their Heavenly Father. They have left the church. They've gone away, and they think they cannot come home again. I have great news for you and for them. You can come home again. Our lives are made up of decisions, both good and bad. Way back in the day, 1994, yes, I'm that old, I had an opportunity to move to Richmond and I became a youth pastor. I was so excited. One of two reasons. I was utilizing what God gave me and I was a single guy. And back then, churches did not hire single people to be in the ministry. So I hit the ground running and I was doing great. And three months later, I fell flat on my face. And the pastor went, Tom, I love your passion, but your time here is over. I'm 24. I left everyone here. I'm, I'm from here. My home church, they wish me well. And I went, I'm not going back home with my tail in between my legs. I had friends that lived in Baltimore. So they went, hey, come on up here and we'll get you a job. I moved up to, to Baltimore for a, a few months and I was miserable. I was working at UPS in the, in the evenings unloading trucks. I was doing odd jobs and I was barely making it a living. It was only by the grace of God and only by the charity of my friends that put me up that I was existing. I wasn't living, I was existing and at the time, my dad was an executive at the Ford plant when it was in Norfolk. And what he would do is, he gave me a 800 number. He said, Tom, call this every Tuesday at this time, and I will transfer you over to the home phone so you can talk with mom. So I did that every week. And, and one night, it was about two or three weeks before Thanksgiving, I was talking to my dad. He said, Tom, when are you coming home? Well, I'll be home probably the day before Thanksgiving, spend a couple of days, and then I'll have to be back here. He said, no. When are you moving back home? You're miserable. God wants you here. And of course, being the tough guy that I'm not, I started crying. My dad saw through the facade of my brave, my brave face. And it worked all out for him to bring me back home. All my stuff and all. And... and and to this day, 26 years later, he's never thrown that back in my face. We have a Heavenly Father that's even more than that. We have friends at one time were active church members. But for one reason or another, they've left the church. Either because life slapped them across the face and it didn't work out the way they wanted and they got mad and left. Or maybe even yet a pastor or a brother and sister in Christ may have hurt their feelings and they have left and never looking back. I have a dear friend of mine. I work at Dollar Tree Stores, the corporate headquarters. It's the tower if you go by Greenbrier. And God has really, as in her words, dealt her family a, a harsh blow. Her son, years ago, got addicted to heroin. And through the harshness of the addiction of them trying to help him through it, they fell out of church. They were good, strong Christians going to church every week. And I would talk with her every week on how things are going with her son. How you doing? And I remember our last conversation last year went, how's church going? I know you left that church and now you're going to another church. She said, Tom, to be honest, we just stopped going. This got too hard. And I went, let me encourage you to go back. They, they slipped through the cracks because of they got tired of putting on the brave face, the, 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 the paper mache mask 
that um, we call the hypocrites. It's the, the Greek actor, hypocrite. And it basically is a paper mache mask that they would put on and act out a play. So they got tired of trying to put more paper mache on their mask. So they just took the mask off and stopped going to church because it got too hard. Today we're going to look at a parable that we have mislabeled. We tend to look at the parables from man's perspective, not God's. In man's perspective, this parable is the prodigal son. They went, oh, that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, I know the prodigal son. But from God's perspective, it should be called the parable of the forgiving father. Because it's really about how the father relates back to the son after he leaves and comes back. The story is, of course, we all hear it. We, the son said, give me my money. I'm going to go away to a far land, have fun, live it up. And all of a sudden, he falls flat on his face, hits rock bottom, and he comes back home. And what does he find? Forgiveness, mercy, compassion. And that's what we find when we return to our Heavenly Father. Every one of us. But have you ever considered the context of our story? If not, I'll lay it out for you. That our story today is a, real, a reply of Jesus back to the religious sect. In the first part of, um, of the chapter, Jesus faced critiques from the religious people. It says in verse 1, it's on the screen behind me. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming to him, coming to Jesus, to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began grumbling, grumble, 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 saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Oh my goodness, how dare you? How dare you get dirty? How dare you, Jesus, touch those that are dirty? So Jesus, in reply, tells three stories. One about a shepherd, one about a woman, and one about a merciful father. And Jesus always uses atypical heroes in his parables. At this time, shepherds were the lowest class they were. In fact, ju the judge wouldn't even listen to their testimony in, in a court of law. Women at this time were even below livestock. A man would risk his life to get his cow out of a quicksand, but if his wife was in quicksand, he'd go, I'll get another one. But Jesus uses these people to convey truths that went over the heads of the religious sect. He told them, basically, at it, after each story, the hero would call all their friends together and have a party. Celebrate, celebrate. And the idea was that to God, when something is lost, you celebrate. God would bring his friends together and have a party because something that was lost was recovered. And it's ironic that the people that Jesus was talking to were not celebrating because Jesus was reaching the lost. Let me post something. Maybe those religious people were not really friends of God. Maybe they're just marking off something that they needed to do, thinking that they needed to do something. But we're going we're gonna to concentrate on the last story, the parable of the forgiving father. And in my research, I came across this one book that called this the greatest short story ever written. So let's dive in. Verse 11 of chapter 15, it says, And he said, Jesus, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls on me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now, when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent them into his fields to feed swine or pigs. And he would be gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swan was eating. And no one was giving him anything, giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more, more than enough bread? But I am dying here of hunger. I will go 
I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring one of the best robe and put on him. And put my ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead, and he has come to life again. He was lost and had been found. And they began to celebrate. Jesus shared with the audience this story. The story how a son did his own thing, left his father, fell back, fell on his face, came back, and he found grace, mercy, compassion. We know this story. I grew up in church. I've heard this story time and time and time again from the little kid to middle school or back when I was a kid, junior high to high school. And and you hear it preached all the time, don't you? But let's take a moment and look at the affected parties of this. We have a father. Scripture tells us that our Heavenly Father would never leave us, but we can walk away from Him. That was the case of the prodigal son. There's no record that the father was abusive, that he threw out the son. In fact, the son chose to leave the father. He chose to leave someone who cared for him, who loved him, who protected him. And even when he asked for his inheritance, gladly gave it to him. See, according to the Jewish law, this brother, who was the youngest, was entitled to one-third of the estate. There are records saying that fathers had retired early and would give out the, the inheritance early before they passed away, but it was highly unusual, in fact, very disrespectful for a son to demand, not ask for, but demand his inheritance. In doing this, he dishonored his father. And if you would go down to the Old Testament, that was stoning offense. So this boy was so disrespectful toward his father who cared for him that he demanded the money. But his father loved him so much, instead of hauling him to court or kicking him out of the house and killing him, he gave him the inheritance. And of course, the son took it and ran. He walked away from a precious relationship with his father. Since you're here today, you might be thinking, why are you talking about leaving God? Why are you talking about leaving your father? We're all here, Tom. Well, maybe you're thinking, you, you know someone who did that. But a relationship with our father is more than church attendance. It's about having a relationship with him. Maybe you have left God in your head. Maybe you have stopped doing devotions. It's easy to do. Maybe one day you wake up and you're not, you don't fill up reading scripture. Or you don't feel like praying today. And one day leads to two days. And two days leads to three days. And one week leads to two weeks. And so on. Up until it could be years since the last time you read. And you're like, oh my goodness, when was the last time I read scripture? Or last time I prayed And when you see a police car behind you, that doesn't count for praying, by the way. When you look at your speedometer and went, ooh, Lord, please don't let them pull me over. It doesn't count. But it affects you. I remember where Teresa and I met was QVC. And my job was to, I was the supplier to those who packed all the stuff that they would ship out. And I had a co-worker, real nice guy. I remember he got his certification in the forklift. And he got paid more, and I'm thinking, good for you. And all of a sudden, one day, I'm going in the back of the warehouse, and I'm smelling this horrible smell. And then I look, there was a liquid everywhere. This Yahoo, nice enough guy, he was getting cardboard out, came up too far, and when he came out, ripped the sprinkle head off so liquid went everywhere. It smelled so bad, I thought it was a chemical coming out, but someone went, no, Tom, that's water. 
It was stagnant water trapped in the pipes for years. So when it came out, it stank. Ripley and I like to go for what I call walk talks. We do a mile walk and we talk and she mainly talks about her love for dogs. And I encourage her in her, her life. And our path, there's always a footpath that we walk. And whenever it's low tide, she goes, woo-wee, it sinks out here. It's, a, it's swamp land. It's water. It's marshland. So when it's down, you smell the water that stinks. That's what happens to us when we stop growing in our walk with God, stop reading, our, our, our mental attitudes start stinking. Our reacting to things start stinking because we're not rooted in God's Word. That happens. Not only did the prodigal son leave his father, he left family. We know he had a brother. The Bible clearly tells us later in, in our, the parable that his brother wasn't happy that he didn't get a little calf to party with. So he had a brother, but he may have had a mother or sisters or cousins or aunts and uncles, maybe grandparents. We're not sure of his family tree, but we know that he left family behind. When we leave our Heavenly Father, we leave a family behind, our godly family, our church family behind. For some of us, we're closer to our spiritual family than our biological family. But when we leave, we leave encouragement of our family behind. And that's what he did. He left all that behind to do what he wanted to do. But why did he do that? Why would he do that? I would argue that he did that because of his prideful rebellion. Proverbs 6.18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Some of us are living examples of that. We had prideful, so we left God behind. We had pride, so we left family behind because we wanted to do our own thing. That was the root cause of his rebellion was pride. In verse 13 it says, And many days later the younger son gathered everything he had. The father sold all that he had to sell to give his son one-third of the inheritance. So it took a couple of days for him to do that. So it took a couple of days for him to pack up his stuff. And he left everything together. And he went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Did you, did you see what I see? He, he did what he thought was best, the young man. We're not sure his age, but we know he's young enough where he doesn't know better. He thought he did. He thought he was all grown. You Remember, guys, when you thought you were all grown and you wanted to step up to the dad? I remember as a wee little kid, my dad always wrestled with me. And I remember thinking when my dad got on his knees and I'm up to here, and I'm like, oh, I'm taller than my dad. Let's go. And all of a sudden, I'm upside down. He has one hand going, kush, 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 like that. And I'm thinking, what just happened? I'm taller than my dad. What just happened? That's what this guy was talking about. I'm bigger than my dad now. I'm stronger. I know better than what my dad is. I'm out of here. But he fell on his face. He thought he could handle things on his own. He thought he did not need his father's guidance or his dad's direction. Every backslidden person has that mindset. I know better than God. You see, that, the definition of sin is self-improvement without God. We, all, we, we, we think that we don't need God to help us as we live our life. I don't need God to get that promotion. So I want to go out with the hierarchy of my company, maybe have a couple drinks and get a little tipsy or maybe tell an off-color joke here or there just to be part of the guys to get that promotion. Instead of trusting God who says, I'm the one who puts the kings on the throne or trusting God that I own the cattle of a thousand hills. He will bless you when He's ready to bless you. But we don't want to wait on God. So we do things on our own. We want to improve ourselves without God. So we lie, cheat, steal. The Bible tells us that God tells us not to forsake the assembling in my presence, but we tell ourselves, I don't need church. I can do this Christian walk on my own. I don't need a brothers or sisters. The Bible says pray, but your pride says it's a waste of time. 
I remember when I was in high school and I prayed that I would pass my SATs and I failed. But you don't realize you didn't study for your SAT, so you're blaming God for something that you could have done. The Bible says study the Word, God's Word. But your pride says it's a waste of time. It's a, it's a, a, a bunch of stories. It's a bunch of wisdom. It's not fact. The Bible says, draw near to me, but your pride says, I can do this on my own. There's a, 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 um, an Arab proverb. If you throw a stone in a pack of dogs and the dog that yelps the loudest is the one that got hit by the rock. So if you're starting to get that body blow feel, the Holy Spirit's doing something. Don't ignore it. Start asking God, is this me, God? Have I drawn away from you without knowing it? Because it doesn't happen like that. It's a little at a time. A little at a time. A little at a time. Just like that rock in the middle of the stream that used to be a huge boulder, a little bit at a time, the water just rolled over it. And before long, that big, ugly-looking rock, it's a small, smooth pebble. It happens before you know it. The pride is the cause of our rebellion. If we go further down, we'll see the consequences of this rebellion, of his rebellion. There are many devastating consequences that could happen when we take things in our own hand. Verse 14, it says, Now when he has spent everything, he's poor now, he has nothing. A severe famine occurred in that country. And he began to be impoverished. And he went, so he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he spent, and he sent him out to, the, to his fields to feed swine. And he would have been gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine was eating. And no one was giving him anything. He has left family behind. At first, he was fine because he had money in his pocket. And while he had money in his pocket, he had friends. He, had, he partied every night. He had friends. He had girls coming his way, batting their eyes at him because he had the nice clothes. He had the nice car. He had the big, thick roll of, of bills in his, in his, in his, in his pocket. He had friends out. And that's how it is with us. When we first leave, God, the world, your old friends went, oh, we were wondering how long it would take you to come back to us. Let's go out and have some fun. Let's do what we used to do. Let's have some good stuff. But when things hit the fan, what happens? You're all alone. It's like rats running away from a sinking ship. Imagine that the prodigal son... I imagine that he spent hours afterwards wondering what his family was up to. Probably longing to hear wise words from his dad. Maybe wondering, wishing he had another really bad dad joke. I tell good bad jokes to the point where my daughter bought me these socks. It says, have you heard a really good bad dad joke? Maybe he was wondering... Man, I wish, what was the punchline of that joke my dad used to tell me? Or, well, wonder what my, my brother's doing now. He was all alone. He was wallowing in his own sorrow, in his loneliness. When we leave God and we leave our family, we leave behind people that used to encourage us. A Sunday school teacher. Maybe the music. This is really good music, by the way, this morning. You miss that. The scripture was telling us, told, is telling us that no one was giving him anything. He, was, he, was, he had hit rock bottom. Imagine the consequences of a Jewish boy feeding pigs. Remember, pigs are the dirtiest animal there is to a Jewish person. That No Jewish person would, would raise pigs. Imagine the dishonor he was in that he had sunk so low that that was the only job he could get was, was feeding these filthy pigs to the point where he was wondering, I wonder what this would taste like. Pigs eat filth, slop, trash. But he was looking at this stuff going, I'm so hungry, I would eat anything. 
there's a show we enjoy watching that's on the History Channel called Alone. And if you ever watch it, you have these people that are survivalists and said, I can do this alone. And basically, they put in the middle of nowhere and they have to survive. They have to build their own lodging. They have to find their own food. They have to do their own thing. And the worst thing is their mind. That's why a lot of people quit. But it's a competition. Whoever wins gets $500,000. And some of the stuff they eat, though, it's amazing. One of the time it was a slug, and this guy was going, oh, it's a slug. Oh, it's protein. And he popped it in his mouth, and you can see it in his face, like, ah. He's just chewing it. And, he, and, and you can see it in his face. He's trying not to spit it back out because his body needed the protein. This is where this guy was. He had nothing. He was wasting away to nothing. And he's like, oh, looking at this filth, magnet-filled, whatever, potato, going, oh, if I just take that out of the way, I don't know. But he had hit rock bottom. We are told that there's always consequences of sin. James 1.15 says, Then when lust has conceived... It gives forth, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. This death could be the death of trust between husband and wife because of an affair. It could be the death of innocence. It could be physical death, or more importantly, it could be spiritual death. But there's always consequences of sin. It doesn't always happen like that, but there's always consequences. If you would have told that young man while he was on his his horse galloping away from the farm that, hey, you're going to regret your your decision, he's going to laugh at you like, whatever, I got all the money in the world, I'm good, woohoo. We're not sure how long ago it took, but now he's at the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of a well, looking up, and he can't see anything out. That's what happens to us when we're away from God. You find yourself covered in the filth of this world, the stink of the awful sin that you're trapped in. You're starving spiritually. You're lonely. You're miserable. And there's no hope in sight. This is what we see and this is what we feel when we throw God out. When we leave God out of the equation. But there is hope. There is a reunion we see. And before we read verse 17, I want to tell you something. Satan is a liar. He's the great deceiver. He's probably whispering in your ear right now, it's too late. You've been gone too long. You've done too many bad things. But I'm here to tell you that there's nothing that you can do, have said, or not done, or not said, that will keep God from restoring you back to the relationship that you had. He's here with arms wide open, ready to welcome you back. See, the prodigal son came to his senses, and he, he, he said, okay, I'm going to have this plan. He, he's, he is Hannibal from the A-team. I got a plan that works every time. So he's coming up with this plan, and we see it in 17. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I am dying here with hunger. And I will get up, I will get up, and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you, against heaven and against your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me one of the hired men. And I, I imagine this guy very dramatic in his head. It's like the really bad actor and actresses you saw in high school thinking, I'm going to be the next Brad Pitt. And you see them act, and they're doing all this stuff. And you're like, whatever. Slow your roll, kid. You're not that good. He's probably doing that in his own head. Very dramatic. I want to make a big scene out of it. But he remembered how great his father treated this hired servant the servants that he had. These servants have warm clothes, a warm bed to sleep in, clean clothes, bread to eat. And he's probably been sleeping out in the field, had nothing to eat. 
he probably stinks the high heaven of, of whatever that's out there. So it's a good plan. So he's like, okay, I want to do this. I want to pick up all what I have left and go home. I am convinced that he is not yet repentant. He is not quite there to make things right with his, his father. He's basically hit rock bottom and like, okay, I need a way out. This is the easiest way for me to get out of this by going home, sucking up my pride and making the big show out of it. And then my father, who is a pushover, will, will at least hire me back. That's what's his hope. That's what we do, too. We make, we make deals with God. When we get ourselves into trouble, and we're like, okay, God, if you will get me out of this trouble, I will do X, Y, and Z. It re- reminds me of an old movie. It was a... Um, a um, Burt Reynolds and Don DeLuise movie. I think it was eight, late 70s, early 80s. And whenever these guys got together, I remember as a kid hurting myself laughter. Laughing, laughing, laughing. And I forgot what the movie it's called, but basically they met in a sane asylum. Robert, uh, Burt Reynolds' character tries to commit suicide, so he's put in a sane asylum where he meets Don DeLuise's character, who is insane. So they come up with a plan to to help Burnt Reynolds kill himself. And toward the end of the movie, Burnt Reynolds is swimming out in the ocean. He's going to drown himself. He's about, I don't know, half a mile off the coast, and he comes to his senses. He's like, I don't want to die this way, but I'm so tired. So he slowly starts swimming back to the shore, and he's talking to God. God, if you let me live, I will give all my wealth away. He's a wealthy uh, Hollywood producer. In the, in the movie. And as he gets closer, God, if you can help me, I'll give three quarters of my fortune away. And as he lays on the beach, breathing and sighing, he said, okay, thanks God for getting me this far. I'll take it from here. And the way the movie ends is that Don DeLuise's character pops out of nowhere with a knife and he, is he's chasing him up and down the beach trying to kill him, helping his friend to commit suicide. That's how the movie ended. But we, too, are like that character from Burt Reynolds. If you will do this, I will, give, I will go to Africa and be a missionary. If you get me out of this, God, I will give half of my savings to the orphans. If you get me out of this, I will give 10% of my wealth to the church. Oh, thank you for getting me out of this, God. I'll take it from here. That's where I think the prodigal son was in his mind. But something happened. He came face to face with his father's compassion. Verse 20. So he got up, came to his father. As he was on his way, he's probably practicing the speech over and over again in his head. With the, with the, and all the, in his head, making a big show out of it. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran and embraced him, and kissed him. This tells me something. His father was looking for him. We're not told in the Scripture, but I'm thinking that the father probably handed over the management of the estate to the oldest son. We get that vibe from the older son. That's probably why he got so miffed that he didn't get a little lamb a little calf to play with for his friends because he'd been working so hard. But he spent his days sitting on the porch, just looking out, just looking. He sees a a body and he looks. He said, no, that doesn't look like my son. He's looking, he's looking. He spent, we're not sure how long the prodigal son is gone, but we know that his father was looking for him because he saw him. Imagine, put yourself in the father's sandals. You spent day after day looking and longing to have your son home. And all of a sudden, in the afternoon, just before the sun was setting, you see a a little figure. He's getting closer and closer. And you're looking, you're looking. He kind of looks like Jonah. That's the name of the prodigal, if you didn't know that in my own head. Is that Jonah? It kind of... It walks like Jonah. The same kind of cadence, 
a lot smaller than Jonah was when he left. Is it? It, it is. He gets up and he runs. He doesn't walk. He runs, embraces his son, welcomes him home. And at first, it was relief to the prodigal because, see, really, he didn't know what to expect. Legally, the father could have had him killed for his dishonor. Legally, he could have shunned him. So as the prodigal son was getting closer and closer to his town, he's walking the path and he sees the billboard that you're 50 kilometers away from Jerusalem. He gets closer and closer. You're 20 kilometers away from Jerusalem or whatever village he's living in. And he knows that the, the, the farm is five kilometers away from Jerusalem. So he sees a, the, another, you're 10 miles away from Jerusalem. And he's thinking, I'm five, mile, I'm five kilometers away from my home. He's getting closer. He's getting closer. He has no idea what to expect. All of a sudden, he sees a blur, a gray white blur coming toward him. And it's his dad like this. Tears rolling down his, his eyes. Grabbing, tackling him. Hugging him. Welcoming him home. I think that is when the true repentance happened. In verse 21, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He didn't say it like this and like that. I am convinced it was more of a whisper through the tears. Maybe he's whispering it in his father's ear because his, his face is in his father's neck. Maybe he was so overcome, he fell on his knees and was looking up and, please, Dad, forgive me for what I did to you. The prodigal son was crushed. Another word for repent is contrite. And in the Greek and Hebrew, it means to be broken, crippled, or crushed. I think the compassion of his father so overwhelmed this young man that it has crushed his spirit. He saw the impact of his actions on his father. Maybe he sees that his father has aged the time that he was gone. Maybe he saw the worry on his father's face that crippled him, that crushed him. But whatever it was, that was when he repented. The word repent is to do a, to do a 180 this way. So when we repent of our sins, we go from going south, turning, doing a U-turn, and going north. That's what true repentance is. And that's what this young man did. That's what we are called to do in order to come back to God. But like all the other stories, there's a celebration that happens. In verse 22 it says, But the father said to his slaves, Quickly, not hurry, not, not go get it. He said, Quickly, bring out the best robe. Put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. Before Beyonce said it, the father said it. And sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf out and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. Let us celebrate. Everything that the prodigal son was missing was, reinst was reinstalled. He was fully restored, not partly. See, if he would, would have made him a hired servant, he wouldn't have been restored. He would have been a hired ling not part of the family. He was completely restored. By giving the robe, his father was honoring him. By giving him a robe, he was telling the community that my son is part of my family. By giving him a ring, it was giving him authority. But legally, when a person would give the signet ring to someone else, he was giving them the power of attorney. He was giving them authority. So he's telling everyone around that my son has a my authority of the family. And by giving him sandals, he was telling everyone he is not a slave. There's a story that when a, an indentured servant met his contract, 
part of the agreement is that the master would give him a pair of his sandals. And that was telling him he was free. He was no longer a slave. But by giving his son his sandals, he was reestablishing his family. When you come back to God, we can expect the same. Psalm 103.12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so he has removed our transgressions from us. I remember when I first read this years ago, when I was a teenager, I went, okay, no big deal. But the thing is, if you start going east, you never stop going east. If you're able to walk on the water, if you go east, you keep going east. If you go north, you eventually start going south. But you never stop going east if you start going east. So that's what God is telling us. When you come back to me, whatever you've done while you are away is forgiven. I came across this story about Abraham Lincoln. He was being interviewed by a uh, newspaper man right in the middle of the Civil War. And the writer of the article asked Abraham Lincoln what he would do when the war was over and that the Confederacy was crushed. How would he treat the rebellious Southerners that succeeded from the Union? And Abraham Lincoln told this man, he quoted him, I will treat them as if they have never been away. That's what our Father does with us. When we come back to Him, broken, crushed, asking to be restored, He went, where have you been? It's great to have you home, honey. He will embrace us. He will welcome us back. back. And He will never, like my father, 26 years later, has never brought up bringing me home from Maryland, ever. He will never throw it back in your face that, you did this and that and this and that. He'll go, what sin are you talking about? It's behind, under the blood. So what are you wrestling with? Are you mentally away from God right now? Ask God to help you. He will reestablish you. Start by reading a chapter a day. And I've been transparency i've gone weeks without reading and i realized what why am i why is my reaction so stinky why is my attitude so poor i went wait a minute i haven't opened this and i remember when i returned and that first time i read psalms tells us it's like honey to the lips and it is it's amazing you open it up and you read and your spirit is full and you, you get that power or maybe that you made a poor decision and you're in the middle of that consequence Con sin, everything has consequences but God is here to help us through that consequence I remember years and years and years ago uh, focused on the family James Dobson was talking about how um, he led um, the old president of Panama to Christ, Noriega. So what happened back in 1989, our soldiers went down and arrested him because he was a drug lord and president. He was waiting trial in Florida, and James Dobson was able to have an audience with him. And James Dobson in his radio broadcast, said that he was able to lead him to Christ. He was still facing consequences of his actions, life in prison, but he was a new Christian. So you might be facing consequences, but there's still relief in the name of Jesus. There's still love in the arms of God. So let me encourage you, prodigal, come back home to the hands of a merciful father. Because he's here with arms wide open.